Okay. Okay, so the, the seminar will begin in a minute. We're giving people one more minute to join. Uh, okay, I think we are ready to start. Okay, uh, welcome everybody to a SCORI webinar in a series of uh, webinar. I think it's number four, if I counted correctly. Uh, in a series of webinars on interesting, relevant, and urgent topics uh, related to the mission of SCORI. Our uh, presenter today is Joshua Alpert, who is Director of Special Projects for C40, which is a network of the world's mega cities committed to addressing climate change. He's been with C40 for the past four or five years. Uh, as a director of special projects, Josh runs C40 Think Tank, creating and developing new programs to be implemented by C40 cities. Currently, he is the North America lead for C40. Uh, he's in, uh, he talks to us from Portland, Oregon, which is right now seven in the morning. Uh, and uh, so he's the uh, lead for C40 Thriving Cities Initiative, also serving as C40's lead on uh, COP26 Cities Race to Zero program. Uh, and he's also the city's, uh, the city's head of Bloomberg Philanthropy American Cities Climate Action Challenge. Uh, prior to joining C40, Josh Alpert was Chief of Staff to Mayor of Portland, Oregon, uh, Charlie Hales. He holds a, PhD, uh, uh, a law degree from Northwestern School of Law. I am Halina Brown, and I will be moderating this meeting uh, if you have questions, please type them on the chat. That's how I will know your questions. And also, since I have this moment, let me say that our next seminar in the series will be held on Monday. Remember, it's Monday, not Tuesday. There was some confusion. Monday, February 20, 22nd. And I will be the speaker at the seminar. Uh, talking about multi-stakeholder processes toward climate action on a city level, a relatively smaller city, not like C40 city, a city of almost 100,000 residents. So welcome, Josh, and the floor is yours. Great, thanks, Helena, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening. <laughs> um, I'm Josh Alpert, as Helena mentioned, and um, I've been working with SCORI for uh, about a year now, maybe a little over a year, and am delighted to be here uh, talking with all of you. Uh, I gave uh, a, a webinar last year, I think, uh, kind of on the underpinnings of the work that C40's been doing around consumption. And this is uh, kind of an update to that, talking about where we've been over uh, the past six or eight months or so and where we're headed. Uh, for those who joined my, uh, my talk last year, um, there's lots of new things that have been happening. And for those that uh, weren't able to join last year, I'm going to do a little bit of a background first on C40 and uh, all the uh, appropriate propaganda that goes with explaining what it is we do and who we are, and then um, jump right into consumption. Um, and as Helena said, please do feel free to ask questions in the chat. And uh, as soon as I run through these slides, then we can uh, then we can have a, a discussion about it. Um, as you can see here on my opening slide, uh, C40 commissioned a report uh, that our research team did uh, really throughout the throughout 2018, uh, and it was published uh, in 2019, 
all about sustainable consumption in cities. And for C40, this was the first time we had really kind of looked under the hood, if you will, at what's actually happening on the ground in cities at a personal level. Um, I'll talk a little bit later about this report and kind of why it uh, led C40 to really get invested in working around uh, urban consumption. But first, uh, just a little bit about who C40 is. Uh, C40 is a group of mayors uh, and only mayors uh, and representing now I think it's 97 cities, not 96, uh, almost all of which are uh, the world's mega cities. We do have about 20 or so what we call innovator cities, which are smaller cities, uh, but cities that have always been kind of on the cutting edge of working around climate issues. Um, our organization is led by mayors. Uh, we take direction from our mayors and uh, they, our steering committee is made up uh, entirely of, of mayors. I think we have 16 mayors on our steering committee. Uh, the cities, as you can see, are representative of the entire world, uh, both global south and global north. Uh, comprise over 700 million citizens and equate to about a quarter of uh, the global economy. Our, uh, our current chair uh, is Mayor Eric Garcetti of Los Angeles, uh, who took office um, in December of, gosh, 2019 now. Um, at really a, quite an auspicious time to take the reins of a global mayor's organization as COVID was hitting. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that in a few minutes. Uh, and our uh, board president uh, is and has been for quite a while, uh, former New York mayor, Mike Bloomberg. Uh, and he really, um, he chairs the, um, the board of directors of C40, which is functions really as our, uh, financial arm and um, business arm while our mayors uh, uh, work on C40 strategy. Um, in 2016, uh, C40 uh, got to work on what became really a, a watershed moment for, for us and for our cities uh, by working on a report called Deadline 2020. And that report uh, really tabulated what it would take for cities to reach uh, a 1.5 degrees Celsius world as outlined in the Paris Agreement. In fact, if you remember, uh, when the Paris Agreement was passed, it was an under two degree uh, threshold that uh, the world was supposed to meet. C40 pushed on that and uh, required that all of our cities actually strive to reach a 1.5 degree uh, uh, target and that now has become really standard around the world uh, and a lot of it was because of this report that uh, that our research team did and recognizing that if if we really are going to get to net zero by 2050 then we needed to back that down to 2030 targets and really look to see within cities uh, greenhouse gas uh, emissions reduction uh, of about 60% by 2030. As you can imagine, our cities all freaked out uh, with such an ambitious target, uh, but deadline 2020, then the report led to a program uh, that required all of C40 cities to uh, create a, and begin implementing by the end of 2020, uh, a climate action plan that equated to a 1.5 degree um, uh, no more than a 1.5 degree rise uh, within their cities. Uh, out of our 97 cities, uh, by the end of last year, we got, I think, uh, just over 70 cities who reached that target, uh, have climate action plans that are, uh, that are congruent with the Paris Agreement. And um, we gave a little bit of a disp dispensation because of COVID, uh, of course, in 2020 uh, really decimated a lot of the capacity within our cities to do this. So we're uh, expecting uh, in the first quarter of this year, another 10 or 15 cities to complete deadline 2020. Uh, and then by hopefully the middle of this year, <clears throat> all of C40 cities will have uh, an active climate action plan uh, 
that reaches uh, no more than a 1.5 degree rise in, uh, in greenhouse gas emissions within their city. The next step, uh, starting really, I guess, midway through last year, but now in earnest this year, is to take those climate action plans uh, and really reduce them to the top three to five major actions that came out of that, uh, and then create these two to three year work plans so that we can really start getting uh, down to the ground level in all of our cities on uh, the sectors that you can see to the left uh, here on this, this graph. Um, and the ones in the light blue, uh, food adaptation, air quality, clean construction, uh, are kind of the at the top of the list for a lot of our cities right now uh, for a variety of, of different reasons. Um, but suffice to say, all of our cities right now are uh, incredibly active in uh, working on these two to three year work plans. Uh, and C40 staff, which now is, uh, gosh, I think we're just over 300 staff around the world. Uh, are helping all of our cities uh, work through these, uh, these work plans. At the same time, of course, uh, <clears throat> as deadline 2020 was being uh, created and then worked on by our cities, uh, we started to see really for the first time, citizens in cities all over the world take to the streets, uh, of course, uh, with Greta's uh, help uh, with all of the school strikes uh, that really started to inspire the world, uh, C40 recognized that this was the first time we were gonna be able to really uh, connect our mayors to their residents in their cities on climate and start facilitating dialogues. That then led uh, to uh, Mayor Garcetti in LA uh, creating what we think is the first uh, in the world Green New Deal plan for a city. And this was significant for us because it was the embodiment of things that we had been talking about for a while, recognizing that, uh, that finally climate change was uh, kind of top of the fold in headlines around the world. Uh, and that residents and citizens were um, recognizing that they have a role to play. We all have a role to play in doing this. And so uh, Los Angeles uh, worked on this Green New Deal plan for a couple of years. And at the forefront of it is what we call inclusive climate action, really getting uh, residents of any city to co-create with city officials, uh, policymakers, the private sector, anyone with a stake in this uh, and the capacity to step up and help all forming coalitions and cities around the world to work on this. That then became the underpinning uh, for the work ahead for C40. And then of course, right in the middle of it, COVID hit. Uh, C40 spent the bulk of last year working through uh, a task force led by the mayor of Milan, Mayor uh, Bebe Sala, who organized uh, about 15 or so mayors from around the world to create a C40 mayor's agenda for a green and just recovery. Uh, that task force uh, launched this report. That report uh, became viral very quickly and went all over the world to cities outside of C40. And you can see here that the underpinning of that report are uh, inclusive economy work, resilience and equity and health and well-being. This was really for the first time at C40, uh, a, a huge shift in the way that we talk with our cities and the way that cities talk with us where we weren't focused so much anymore on uh, greenhouse gas emissions, on the science behind anything uh, that we had been working on from a climate perspective, but instead really put people first. And I can tell you that that was a sea change, not only for our cities, but for staff at C40 as well, who are largely very technical uh, science-based uh, experts and um, kind of opened up uh, a Pandora's box, a good Pandora's box, if you will, uh, for both uh, staff at C40 and for our mayors in figuring out how do we actually make this shift real on the ground rather than just talking about it. And so if there's 
uh, a silver lining to COVID, which there really aren't. But uh, if we if we try hard enough, we can start teasing some things out. This was one of them for us because uh, we recognized that as mayors were struggling with all of the billion things that mayors are struggling with right now, COVID was was uh, kind of a, a linchpin for us in getting mayors to really start talking differently about the work they're doing, not even just on climate, but really on building agendas for their city and recovering out of COVID. It was an opportunity that we seized and jumped right into. At the same time, uh, we unfortunately saw the postponement last year of COP26 uh, and COP26 for uh, for groups like C40 and our partner networks who work with cities uh, really uh, is and was supposed to be a watershed moment where cities finally had uh, a seat at the table with nations and nation states at COP. Uh, COP26 has been postponed to this November and that was another opportunity because it gave uh, C40 and our partners the ability to really organize uh, cities in preparation for COP26. And uh, the leaders of COP26 and the high level champions that got appointed created what we're calling Race to Zero. And Race to Zero is uh, really a target setting exercise where the private sector, uh, nations, uh, really all the stakeholders are all kind of funneling towards a net zero commitment by 2050. And uh, C40 was uh, invited to be the lead for the city's race to zero and organizing a thousand cities to pledge to uh, reach net zero by 2050. The fundamentals of, of the city's race to zero campaign, uh, you can see here, uh, of course, science-based, everything has to be aligned with a 1.5 degree uh, target. Um, beyond that target, there are actions that cities are going to be required to take, uh, starting with their pledge. Uh, those actions have to be uh, founded within equity, inclusive climate action, and resilience. There's a companion race to resilience uh, component to all of this work, uh, but for now we're just focusing in on race to zero itself. I bring this up uh, because it actually does tie into uh, the bulk of what we're here to talk about consumption. You can see here that for the cities that are signing up to the um, thousand city race, uh, city race to zero pledge, uh, the bulk of the pledge focuses in on uh, inclusive climate action. And that's important for us in the work around consumption because it is really the first effort to put people first in climate. So cities that uh, are signing up and right now we have, uh, we're almost halfway there. We've got about 458 cities, I believe, uh, who've already uh, registered their pledge through Race to Zero uh, and then are invited to join the COP26 proceedings and the run up to COP. Um, this is the first time we've gotten cities anywhere in the world to stand up and say that, uh, yes, they're committed to 1.5 degrees in the Paris Agreement. They recognize this is a global climate emergency. Uh, and now because of COVID, they recognize that coming out of COVID and the recovery for cities has to be based on people uh, as much as it is based on science. That then, of course, gives us the opening uh, to really have our mayors work on the ground in uh, ambitious ways uh, to co-create with their residents uh, on different ways of moving forward. Uh, this actually just came out today uh, and just added it into my slide, but this is an article from Time Magazine, uh, uh, largely about Kate Rayworth and Donut Economics. Um, and I encourage all of you to, to read it. It's a, a fascinating and, and really well-written article uh, that kind of shapes the world of consumption in cities and how uh, cities are starting, starting of course with Amsterdam, how cities are positioning themselves to not only come out of COVID, but to use this as the opportunity to really start looking at different economic models. C40 uh, has been working with Kate for about 
two and a half, almost three years now um, to take do donut economics from a national perspective, which is how Kate initially created it to a local cities uh, tool that, um, that we're starting to use all over the place. We uh, created a program called Thriving Cities Initiative uh, in, I guess, the end of 2018 and uh, started to um, actually put action together in 2019 with three cities around the world as pilots, uh, Amsterdam, uh, Philadelphia, and Portland here uh, where I'm based. And the idea was uh, to get these cities uh, into rooms and back when we were able to actually meet in person and have very frank discussions either with just city staff uh, or a combination of city staff and uh, community residents and stakeholders. In Philadelphia, we did a mixture. In Portland, it was really just geared towards uh, city employees. And in Amsterdam, uh, it was um, like Philadelphia, it was a mixture. And we really, these were pilots in the truest sense. Uh, they were very experimental uh, and Kate came out uh, and led workshops in, in uh, all of these cities. Um, and again, with the idea of taking the donut, uh, which you're probably all familiar with and localizing them uh, and then having uh, residents in those cities co-create with policymakers on what it would take to make the donut real. Um, as I mentioned at the top of this, C40's report on urban consumption uh, spearheaded this work for us because we realized through that work that consumption-based emissions from just C40 cities alone already represented 10% of global greenhouse gas emissions. And if there was no intervention in those cities, that would nearly double by 2050, really blowing out of the water any shot that our cities had of reaching net zero by 2050. Uh, that was enough for us to really get to work and set up a team within C40 to work with Kate and find guinea pig cities to step up and say, hey, we understand this problem. Uh, we don't know what the solutions are, but we want to help. And the Thriving Cities Initiative was born. This report studied six sectors, uh, food, construction, clothing, vehicles, aviation, and electronics. We chose those six sectors particularly because that's where people actually have some power uh, and personal choice within those sectors. Thriving Cities uh, started to recognize the difference between what led us here and where we need to go. And we started to affectionately call the old way of doing things, the good life 1.0 which we're all of course familiar with and are the underpinnings of our capitalist society. But of course, the good life 1.0 uh, no longer is sustainable within planetary boundaries. That then led us to uh, think of, well, what's next? Uh, and of course, what's next is the good life 2.0. And you can see this wasn't necessarily a revolutionary concept with uh, residents around the world. This is something that uh, in no way was top of mind, but in doing a little prodding with people in cities all over the place, um, the really the trappings of what a good life 2.0 are, are things that people are already thinking about, being with family, experiencing new things, uh, spending time with friends and so on. These are things that people really do value, um, but didn't necessarily think a whole lot about. So we brought that out of them to really make sure that this wasn't something that was gonna be earth shattering to people. It was just gonna be something that we had to kind of reshape and message correctly to get people to understand that these are things that are have been valued for a very long time uh, but there's been a disconnect between those values and the policies that cities have been creating of course we we're all very familiar with graphs like this that show the connection between income and consumption uh, you can see here, of course, on the bottom uh, axis, the Good Life 1.0 and GDP per capita uh, and emissions uh, per capita on the left. And you can see as GDP increases, so do emissions. 
and uh, related uh, to this uh, is this graph, which I'm sure all of you have seen as well, which essentially says that the more money that you have uh, does not at some point then equate to happiness. And you can see there's a plateau uh, where happiness starts to flatten out uh, around uh, 30,000 to 40,000 GDP per capita. So uh, that was enough for us to stop scratching our heads and say, ah, more money does not equate to more happiness. We know that people are valuing happiness and we're starting to understand what's creating happiness amongst people. And lo and behold, not shockingly, um, it is not a capitalist system that is generating happiness within people. So what do we do about it? Uh, well, we recognize that of course, in high income cities and largely global North cities, we need to act, we need to act quickly uh, and there's no time to waste. However, conversely in uh, global South cities and lower income cities, uh, we recognize that growth still needs to occur. Uh, and so a lot of the work that C40 has been doing over the past few years has been really targeted at high income regions and largely global south or global north cities, which is why our pilot cities represent uh, Europe and, and North America. The report showed us uh, that the science behind all of this is real. And if we can affect change within these sectors, you can see here the amount of uh, emissions reduction that can happen. It's significant uh, when we work in buildings uh, and infrastructure from a sustainable consumption uh, vantage point, uh, you can see that total emissions plummet, uh, same with food and, and all of the other sectors here. So that was enough for us to really get serious behind thriving cities. Uh, we were fortunate to get uh, some funding through the KR Foundation, uh, which is a Danish foundation that uh, really is one of the more climate radical uh, foundations I like to think of in terms of them funding pilots on really far reaching uh, programs like Thriving Cities. As I mentioned last year, uh, well, I guess two years ago now in 2019, uh, that was really the onboarding and what we're calling phase one of the Thriving City Initiative of really trying to figure out what is this, uh, what can cities do here, and more importantly, how do we actually spur imagination within our cities to get residents to step up and say, hey, we have a role to play in this. And in fact, we probably have the biggest role to play in this because as we know, sustainable consumption starts with personal choice. You can see on the right here, the donut, uh, and that again, Kate Rayworth uh, really created uh, within the, the blue societal goals, within the green ecosystem service goals. Uh, and the idea is to not overshoot uh, in either. Uh, and in fact, turn uh, as much of the donut as we can blue. Of course, in moving from Good Life 1.0 to the Good Life 2.0, we had to get pretty concrete uh, with examples so that people actually started to understand what we were talking about. And here you can see in a very rudimentary way, um, very simple uh, exercises for people to start doing in our workshops in 2019 in the first phase of Thriving Cities was largely based on this. Uh, in fact, it was uh, a great exercise that we would do in each of these workshops where uh, at various tables, people would have on their table uh, like a plastic car or a little model house, um, a cheeseburger wrapper, uh, really tangible products that people were familiar with in their everyday life. And we would take those objects and ask a series of questions. Um, and that created what we've called the city portrait. Yeah. The city portrait would ask, what does this object represent in terms of uh, a local ecological system, a global ecological system, a local social system, and a global social system? And by asking a series of questions, 
it was very easy then to get to the drivers of consumption through that. As an example, uh, if you take a cheeseburger wrapper, um, we would start off by saying, well, what are the, what are the environmental uh, components of this wrapper? Of course, the manufacturing of the wrapper, uh, the um, manufacturing of the burger that would come in the wrapper. And we would then keep asking, then what, then what? And you would get at some point down to the bottom of this of why do people eat fast food? And there were a huge wealth of answers to this, but at the end of it, we could actually boil them down to things like um, institutional racism, uh, really big uh, concepts uh, that underpin uh, personal consumption. Then the next trick was, well, how do we actually then flip that? Let's see here. This then became the basis for C40 to start working on what we've been calling collective mindset shift. You can see here uh, at the individual level, level and then at the, at the collective level. So before we get into barriers, it became very clear through these workshops that people started to understand this. They started to understand that the choices that they themselves were making in their everyday life had way more uh, in way more impact in the world than anyone ever really stops to think about. Back to the cheeseburger uh, wrapper example, uh, people started to recognize that uh, even in the manufacturing of things like a wrapper, uh, that impacts people in Bangladesh or wherever those materials would come that would create those wrappers. Then we would get into discussions about how those workers were treated, uh, whether they um, were treated equitably within their cities uh, in doing this. And really the whole point of that exercise was to get people to start thinking broader about the things that they were doing. So obviously uh, a complicated system but one, when you boil it down and go through these exercises, it becomes really simple for people to stop for a second and say, ah, the choices that I am making do have worldwide consequence and of course, local consequence here at home. But easier said than done in trying to change that, cities have all sorts of challenges to this. A lot of political barriers, uh, cities have agendas that are billions of pages long uh, and only growing now. Uh, in terms of priority and emergencies uh, and um, not a lot of resource to handle any of those things. Um, there's also been built up in many, many cities around the world, uh, lack of trust and big schisms between residents within the cities and their elected representatives, uh, all of which create barriers for uh, the connection between residents and policymakers to co-create. The thriving cities then uh, really leaned into those barriers to say, okay, we understand uh, the science behind this. We we're starting to understand how mind shift can work. Uh, but if we don't start repairing trust between residents and their elected officials, we're never gonna get anywhere. And so Thriving Cities also then added a component into this work to really start bridging that gap, that trust gap. Let's see here, the city portraits that were starting to be created. These all came out of the workshops that we did in the three cities. And as these workshops were, uh, were continuing, we started to add in more components. So you can see here for uh, any of the three cities, they went on a very similar journey as uh, together. Uh, the first workshop, of course, was really just ground setting and introducing the concepts. Second workshop uh, got us to the drivers of consumption through exercises like the cheeseburger exercise. Um, and then started to really look at, okay, how do we start flipping these drivers of consumption? Workshop three 
uh, then uh, began the co-creation process. And that became pretty significant because that's where the trust gap uh, really started to get worked out. Uh, and for the first time having mayors uh, sit in workshops with residents uh, to talk about what the needs were uh, and what the barriers were to get those needs uh, was really impactful. We're now uh, at the at the kind of phase two stage. Um, just a, a brief pause to say that uh, 2020 for all of us, of course, was insanely difficult. Um, and of course, was difficult for us in trying to figure out how do we actually continue with these in-person workshops when nobody can be in person. Uh, we all, of course, have been now very ingrained in the uh, pros and cons of doing virtual workshops and things like that. But of course, that's where we ended up. But uh, it was actually really uh, empowering to let go of having to be in person because it allowed us uh, to use technology in new ways as well in creating virtual workshops uh, to the point where we started to scale down and make uh, divisible components of the Thriving Cities work available for cities, uh, particularly within the context of things like COVID and economic recovery. So we spent last year really kind of reinventing how this is going to work, uh, while at the same time, of course, uh, leading our pilot cities forward into uh, phase two, building on the work they had done. So we had the three pilot cities uh, continuing to work, but also started to work with cities like Austin, Texas, uh, who had heard about this thriving cities work through the C40 network and said that they were really interested in using the donut uh, to help them through economic recovery. And so we were able to kind of pull things out from the first phase and create kind of these little modules for cities um, that weren't the full-blown Thriving Cities initiative, but really responsive to uh, immediate crises like economic recovery. Uh, that was something we had never really envisioned at the start of this, but because of uh, what happened in, in 2020 was actually very uh, helpful to kind of scope what the full Thriving Cities initiative could be. So as we're entering phase two now, we have kind of the full bore uh, Thriving Cities initiative, which is a multi-year process. And then these kind of shorter, quick um, little patches using Thriving Cities for very specific things. You can see here in phase one, as I mentioned, uh, really introducing the pilot cities, uh, to, to the work, taking the donut uh, and making it from global to local, uh, creating city portraits that were very, very specific to cities um, so that they can start understanding in all of the work that they do where they are in the broader donut uh, to make sure that they're not overshooting and in areas where they are overshooting, uh, creating action plans to get that overshot back down. Phase two now uh, focuses, as I said, on targeted approaches uh, to reducing consumption. And really now, even in, in the pilot cities, getting very concrete on the ground with action plans. So our objectives here uh, for 2021, uh, really fostering and kind of blowing out on a bigger scale co-creation. Uh, in fact, in Amsterdam, which is slightly ahead of the other cities, um, and again, in the Time Magazine article that came out today, they do a really great job of painting the picture in Amsterdam. Amsterdam now has a local donut coalition of over 400 people uh, who all get together to co-create with their uh, local government uh, the variety of policies that are coming out of the workshops. As an example, uh, and it's a, they use it right at the top of uh, the Time article, um, they now have consumption pricing uh, locally in uh, markets all over Amsterdam. So when you go to purchase produce, it breaks down the cost based on uh, the carbon footprint, uh, on uh, things like manufacturing, uh, a whole variety of things that really we've never seen before in, in the world. Um, and those are all just prompts for people as they're uh, going about their day consuming. Those are prompts to say, wait a second, is this something that I actually need to do? And if so, am I doing it in the most sustainable way? Uh, 
once we're kind of through co-creation or as co-creation is happening, uh, then it's up to the city uh, with a capital C and mayors and policymakers to start implementing policies uh, like a consumption uh, uh, costing on things like produce. Then of course, the trick becomes to mainstream uh, all of this work. Uh, and a lot of that is through marketing. And we've been working with uh, experts in, all over the world on mind shift uh, change uh, and the variety of ways using technology and tried and true ways of, of normalizing all of this. Then, of course, there's uh, KPIs that are being created and again co created um, so that we can kind of monitor is this actually working? Are we seeing enough of this mindset shift that we're going to actually start addressing sustainable cons consumption in real and effective ways? And then all of that through networks like C40 get uh, shared and then scaled. So how are we doing all of this? Uh, again, this has now become all virtual. And even when we're able to start meeting again, uh, we're likely going to keep it virtual so that we can actually scale this uh, in meaningful ways. Uh, the best part of, of networks like C40 are it's cities generally talking to cities, and we just kind of facilitate the infrastructure to allow that. And already, cities like Philadelphia uh, and Portland and Amsterdam have been talking uh, with cities all over the world on the work that they're doing and that will continue. Um, and then of course, as this uh, hopefully starts to catch fire all over the place, we'll get more funding uh, to do this in, uh, in cities all over the world. The next step will be uh, how do we actually talk about this in ways uh, that are relevant to the global south as we recognize the need for, uh, for more development uh, we also are putting up red flags saying, yes, yes, please do grow, uh, but don't look at models in the global north on how to do that uh, so that we're not actually creating bigger problems uh, in, in global south cities as well. So what does success look like? Uh, by the end of next year for our pilot cities, we'll have action pathways uh, based on co-creation. We'll have communities and businesses collaborating with the city on uh, really creating what is now a new normal of living well within planetary boundaries. Uh, and then we'll be measuring all of this. And uh, from a more holistic standpoint, we'll have a thriving city playbook for all cities around the world, whether you're a C40 city or not, uh, on kind of a step-by-step -step how do we how to guide um, so that we actually can make ourselves irrelevant in that process and let cities do this on their own. I'll stop there. Uh, that was a lot of information in a very short period of time and I've had way too much coffee this morning so I probably talked a little bit too quickly. So uh, I'll stop here and then we can uh, use the rest of the time for discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Josh. Uh, and I got already one uh, couple of questions from uh, Tom D'Alessio asking if you can post the link to Time article here. You say just appear. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, so we have at this point only 15 minutes for questions. Uh, so try to be very specific and Josh, try to be very succinct, if I may ask. And also Tom Delegio asked, who are the key actors in Philadelphia? Uh, great, I uh, just posted the link uh, to the article. Um, so uh, Mayor Kenny in Philadelphia is kind of the, the tip of the spear for the work in, uh, in thriving cities in Philadelphia. Uh, they have taken a little bit of a pause uh, as they're kind of wrestling through a lot of budgetary issues right now. And so while we're keeping, uh, keeping their place and, and keeping things kind of moving, uh, it's going a bit slower. But the, it was interesting, actually, and, and one of the reasons why I, I wanted Philadelphia as a pilot city, they approached this from a, a waste standpoint. Mayor Kenny uh, in his first uh, election, when he was first elected mayor, uh, ran on a cleaning up Philadelphia platform. And we thought about that and thought, oh, that's actually a, a really interesting kind of entry point into consumption. 
if if the mayor was really interested in cleaning the city up and physically cleaning the city up, we had to look at waste and why why is this why is litter all over the city? Uh, that kind of was uh, something we hadn't really thought about as an entry point into consumption, but of course uh, goes hand in hand. And so initially, uh, this was all being run out of the the waste department within Philadelphia. And then uh, as thriving cities kind of works, that gets broadened to all the different uh, departments within the city. Um, the uh, coalition of folks that were brought together outside of city government included everyone from uh, the Philadelphia Eagles to uh, University of Pennsylvania, uh, Temple, uh, and then uh, a lot of nonprofits, local nonprofits on the ground who worked on uh, creating murals within the city. S storytelling is a big part of this. So really it was anyone we thought uh, would have an interest got invited in. Uh, and then we, uh, the workshops were joint between city staff and the community. Thank you. Um, I have a follow-up question. I, after these workshops, then you, you got a sense of how far policymakers will go and politicians and how far citizens will go. I hope you got some sense of it. My question is to how do you, uh, what do you think will get you to the finish line, the mix of outreach to change people's mindsets versus uh, policies which are much more effective but are politically more difficult. I know you're going to say it's a mix, mm -hmm. but but where do you think more uh, chance of success is or success progress? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And, and really it's because we find ourselves now in, in a completely different world than any of us have envisioned two years ago. Um, it, it is, as, as my former boss used to say, crisis is, uh, is only an opportunity. And so we've taken it as that. And it's not just the, the COVID recovery, it is the dawning on people uh, over the past few years that this really is a massive, massive crisis and that people have the ability to affect it. And so I think it's actually not a mixture. This is a, uh, a people-led process. And what we've been doing kind of on the back end as C40 and working you know, directly with mayors is getting mayors prepared to meet with their residents in new ways. Uh, this then becomes the way to bridge the trust gap. And from my vantage point, it's that trust gap that is the biggest barrier. Uh, certainly here in Portland, which a lot of you probably have read over the past year, you know, we, it's, uh, we're, we've always been an experimental city here and we get very loud uh, and there's a lot of rabble rousing that goes here. Uh, but that's all underpinned by a lack of trust between city government and people. Thriving cities can be used to bridge that gap. That's the only way forward because it has to be people led. Politicians, elected officials, and I see John's question here about city manager, board of supervisor systems. It, it doesn't matter at the end of the day what the structure is because elected officials are there to implement the policies that people want. Those are the elections, right? We need to reshape how that all works. Uh, a lot of that's messaging. A lot of that is really working with our mayors on how they campaign for election, what they're saying, uh, and then making good on those promises. Uh, that all, uh, that's all radical thought, uh, although it seems like a no brainer. It takes a lot of time and work. Um, but fortunately, because C40 is a membership organization, uh, we don't charge anything to join. What we require are commitments from our mayors and they have leadership standards. So we have 97 mayors who are all willing to do this. And fortunately, they're mayors with high profiles. And so by getting them prepared to actually hear the people in their community and then implement the things that are bubbling up from, uh, from the community, that's the way forward. That's the only way forward, frankly. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to pose two questions together so maybe you can somehow consolidate the answer. So uh, one question is from Jeffrey Barber, uh, who is asked, what's, the, what's been the biggest difference in approach 
values in reaching agreement among city mayors. Uh, how have compromises avoided watering down effectiveness? And there is another question from Philip Verkracht is what is the participation from businesses, small and big, and the financial sector? Yeah, great questions. Um, I, we we were very intentional in selecting the pilot cities uh, in terms of having mayors who weren't just the usual suspects. It's easy for people to say, "Oh, well, of course Portland is going to do something like this. They're you know a radically experimental city, and we would expect that." Um, and you know, similarly to a city like Amsterdam, although slightly different. Having a city like Philadelphia involved, uh, which is a, a particularly blue collar city and a particularly blue collar mayor, um, we thought, okay, this is this is a way to show that this isn't just a you know crazy far left leaning radical approach. This is something that can be mainstream, and that's why it was really interesting that they wanted to approach it from a very nuts and bolts kind of city government role of cleaning up litter. Um, and so the trick for us was how do we how do we create a program that is that represents that value that this mayor shared um, was elected on. Uh, and that differs, of course, city to city. So we're very intentional at looking at what the values and agenda of uh, our mayors are, and then messaging all of this using those values. Um, it becomes actually much easier the more and more we do it. And of course, we've got now typologies of mayors um, so that we can kind of get them together to, to talk about how they do this. Uh, one fundamental uh, kind of agreement that we set out at the beginning with our cities is, uh, you know, compromise will be a necessary evil through this process, but we need our mayors to hold the line with their councils. Uh, and again, getting into kind of different city government structures. Uh, it's a little bit different in, in all of our cities, whether you have a strong mayor or a weak mayor, but having at least the mayor as the spokesperson for this effort and holding the line saying, hey, this is what our residents are asking us to do seems to be working. Uh, you'll see in the Time article, uh, the city of Nanaimo up uh, just north of me here in British Columbia, uh, there was a lot of disagreement on that council about whether this is something that should go forward, but at the end of the day it is going forward because uh, the mayor was able to say, hey, our, our residents are asking us for this. Uh, that then leads to Philip's question, uh, the participation by business, and that becomes instrumental as well in recognizing who are the mayor supporters? Who are the people closest to the mayor? In a lot of cities, it's business. Uh, and so really understanding the landscape of who those companies are uh, and, and really locally. Uh, so we look at who are uh, headquarter businesses within those cities, who are smaller businesses within those cities. And we want a range and mix of small, big, um, and really all different sectors to be to, to take part in this. And so far, we've gotten a great mix. Uh, Kate came out to Portland uh, for the first workshop and the state actually hosted a dinner uh, for her with the private sector. And it was Nike and Columbia and you know all, a lot of the headquartered businesses here in Oregon uh, at the same table with local nonprofits uh, and really small startup businesses um, to really say, look, we are all in this together. It doesn't really matter whether you're a big business or a small business. At the end of the day, we all live here. Um, we care about these things. What can I do from my vantage point to move this forward? Uh, if I may follow up on this one, uh, how do you make a case for Nike or other uh, such company that you would like people to buy less? of okay. their products, right? This yeah. is the bottom line in consumption, right? What, how, how did this conversation look? Yeah, it's a it's a great question. And, and if you ever get the opportunity, if you haven't already, uh, to hear Kate talk about it, Kate Rayworth, she's, mm -hmm. she's really, really impactful in having these kinds of conversations. And really, it's, it's, a, it's less about people buying less. It's more about people buying smarter. And so companies like Nike 
they're always 10 steps ahead of where the trends are uh, because that's their bottom line. And so it becomes then a conversation of, okay, forget about, you know, coming in and saying, look, we just simply need to consume less in this world. Of course we do. They understand that uh, and they've known that for, for quite a while. So it's more about quality uh, than quantity. And within that, recognizing that a company like Nike has a huge role to play in this because they're a global uh, leader within their market. And so by getting out front first, uh, it helps their bottom line over time because they'll be seen if this all works out and they um, follow through on the things that they've said that they want to do. This then gives them even more market share because they're trusting in us that this is the direction that their consumers want to go. Uh, and so we're helping them forecast the trends of what's to come in the next 10, 15 years uh, okay. based on the science. Okay, that's a, that's a clever approach. I will now read the question from Katya Vladimirova because it is long and I will not try to paraphrase it. Do you address different sectors in your mind shift change template? for cities. Specifically, do you have any particular policy suggestions related to apparel fashion consumption? You already uh, partly addressed it. We are working on some policy solutions for collaborative fashion consumption for Luxembourg and Geneva. Would be interesting to learn from you. So maybe the example of, of uh, Nike is the opening to that answer, right? It is, but even more, even more concrete, uh, and, and they talk about this in the Time article as well, um, it's, it's things like getting industries together to create new standards. And so this is happening within kind of uh, the, the world of denim uh, within fashion. And you know, fashion is something that, that really isn't talked about nearly enough because uh, as you probably all know, I mean, this is a hugely high consumption, uh, high GHG industry. And so we're just starting to scratch the surface at C40 around things like fashion. Um, Amsterdam, uh, fortunately, because they were involved in this, Amsterdam has uh, a huge, if not the highest concentration of denim brands in the world. And so they kind of, jumped right into to the world of denim here and um, got all of the suppliers, uh, the textile suppliers, uh, the brands uh, that, that sell the denim uh, and then other links within the supply chain, supply chain to create what they've called the denim deal. Uh, and that's an agreement to work together to produce 3 billion garments that include 20% recycled materials by 2023. So this is all really fast acting. This isn't like a 10 year plan. This is what do we do right now to change the direction our industry is going? Because again, they're recognizing that if we're to believe, if we're to be believed, city governments are now to be believed, the trend is gonna change and they need to be at the forefront of that in order to create you know, enough market share to keep going. So it's through things like that of us just at the right time, just putting a little seed and saying, hey, wait a second, people are eventually going to wake up through the work that's happening here to say, oh, I shouldn't be buying denim anymore. That's not what the goal is. The goal is how do we actually make these products better, you know, through circular economy and things like that. But even bigger than that, how do we actually take an industry as a whole and make really fast wholesale change? It's through things like this denim compact. Uh, and so we're getting really specific now within sectors to look at these kinds of models. Thank you. Uh, well, it's 11 o'clock and I am sorry to say we have to wrap up. So I want to thank all the participants and most of all you, Josh, this is, this is a fascinating project. And uh, I hope that for, you know, in a couple of years that we'll be able to say, we are really making progress. And this is how we know that we are making progress. So in the meantime, I thank you very much and remind you that our next webinar about local, more local action 
uh, in a multi-stakeholder processes will be held on February 22nd on Monday at 10 o'clock and I hope to see you all there. Thank you and goodbye for now. Great. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Yeah.